morning, everybody. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our to the uh, UP Open University Faculty of Management and Development Studies. Uh, I think this is a let's talk it over program. No, uh, it's a forum on improving outcomes through collaboration lessons learned in neuro oncology okay so we have our speaking speakers right now uh with this uh subject for today to start with our program let me call on uh by the way have you eaten your breakfast already <laughs> yes okay so perhaps we would call on our dean uh, Dr. Inocencio E. Booth Jr. Uh, for a welcome remarks. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the headquarters of the Open University of the University of the Philippines uh, system. So um, I think many of you, this is for the first time you have visited the headquarters. And so we welcome as well our students and we are very thankful we have our guests from the U.S. and um, they come all the way to visit all of you here. They would like to share with us their expertise on, on oncology. So I think uh, the forum that we have right now on improving outcomes through collaboration lessons learned in neuro-oncology will be very much um, relevant uh, to all of you. In fact, um, uh, our speakers would, are all oncologists, are all oncologists. So um, the Los Banos, the headquarters of the UP Open University, is actually a rural landscape. And I hope you would enjoy the landscape right after the forum. Uh, we have several um, uh, historical landscapes here as well. We have the National Art Center of the Philippines, the only one in the country. So it's on top of Mount Makiling, one of the legendary mountains of the country where several Americans and Europeans were having botanical explorations in the early uh, 14th century. So we hope uh, we will learn a lot from this forum and um, the students, uh, many of you are doing your um, thesis right now. And I hope um, you will enjoy the rest of your stay in Los Banos today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean June. Uh, the next part of our program, I think, is on the introduction of the speakers. However, before I call on Professor Ramos, uh, somebody is asking a while ago, what does neuro-oncology mean? No, what does it mean? Neuro means nerves. Oncology means cancer. <laughs> so to those who are non-medical or non-health related uh, in the disciplines, so that's what you call neuro-oncology. Okay, so let me call on Professor Rita Ramos to introduce our speakers for today. Okay, good morning. Uh, before we further uh, start our program, I would like to introduce first our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Santos uh, Kesari, is a, prof is a professor of neurosciences at UC San Diego School of Medicine and director of neuro-oncology at Moore's Cancer Center. His research investigates the biology of gliomas with uh, with the aim of developing new therapeutics for patients with brain tumors. He has a long-standing interest in neural development and cancer stem cells and is focusing on their role in the formation of brain tumors and uh, resistance to treatments. Let us all welcome Mr. Uh, Dr. Santos Kesari. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. 
and to come halfway around the world to t give you a talk um, about neurooncology. I will make one connection with the forest and the focus on the environment, um, and that is that many of the old chemotherapy drugs are natural products that have come from plants and fungus and mushrooms and things like bacteria, et cetera, that are found. There may be a cure for cancer on that mountain that you mentioned. So, so, um, so what, I, what I'm going to basically do is introduce uh, neuro-oncology, what we do, what we're trying to do, which is to try to... Hear me? Yeah. Is that um, you can make a difference. You know, in academics and in life, whenever you're studying, et cetera, you think you're doing a job um, and you move on in life. But if you have a focused effort, which is what we're trying to do, you can actually make a transformational difference. And I always use this example of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that is a foundation in the U United States that tries to find a cure for cystic fibrosis. And as you know, medical, many medical diseases, it takes years and decades to make a difference. But this foundation invested 20 years ago in developing a drug for cystic fibrosis and invested a lot in research and drug development. And, and they were successful last year in developing the first drug for cystic fibrosis. And in fact, they have a second drug that I think is approved or going to be approved even this year. So it's a long road, but I think if you have the right vision, you can make a difference that's going to help a lot of people. And so what are we dealing with? We're dealing with brain tumors, which is something that occurs in, from birth to death, from kids, young adults, adults, and elderly patients develop different types of brain tumors that are listed here. Um, I don't know, can you see the, no. Anyway, you can see the different types of cancers that are listed in various age groups. So we're trying to learn a lot uh, in terms of what is the biology of these tumors in these different age groups. What are the mutations? What's the immunology, which is becoming very important? And then we're also seeing, especially in kids, these patients, when we treat them with radiation and chemotherapy, they can survive for many years and many decades afterwards and grow up as adults. And we have to deal with the problems that they deal with, the late effects of the, the radiation and chemotherapy, endocrine problems, growth problems, cognitive effects. So what is neuro-oncology? This, this slide lists all the different types of diseases that we deal with, from primary brain tumors to metastatic cancers, such as lung, breast, going to the brain, as well as all the symptoms related, neuropathy, fatigue, headaches, pain, etc. So it's a pretty broad field, and in the U United States, at least, there's a growing population of physicians and nurses trying to take care of such patients, and there's a need for it. And even in the Philippines, there must be at least three, at least three or four neuro-oncologists that I know about, um, I guess mainly in Manila. But one of the things that I've learned a long time ago is, you know, if you want to make a difference, you need a team effort uh, to do this, uh, and if you want to do it fast. And so when I moved to San Diego many years ago, we set up a research team and a clinical team really focused around pushing the envelope forward about drug development and understanding the disease. And since I started, there were three people, and now we have probably 15, 20 people that are focused around brain tumors over the years. From, as you can see, from pathologists, radiologists, oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, scientists, and nurses all help in this process. And here's the main types of tumors that we see, glioblastoma, which is the most malignant, called GBM at the top, as well as brain metastasis, meningiomas, slow-growing tumors, et cetera. Some of these slides I'm going to skip because these are more sort of uh, technical. But one of the things that we focused around is really research. Because the prognosis is so poor, we need to have clinical trials. And that's been the mainstay of our program, is to get new drugs for patients um, as quickly as possible. And so we worked very hard. And you'd be surprised to know that we have, we're injecting viruses into the brain, like herpes viruses, adenoviruses, all kinds of viruses into the brain to induce an immune response. We're also making vaccines out of the tumors that we take out of patients. And then we're also do, you, doing trials of new drugs. And one of the things that will be highlighted later with uh, uh, Marlon is about what are the outcomes? You know, what are the side effects? What are the, uh, what, what, what exactly, how, how are these patients and caregivers doing? 
So here's, at least in the United States, the incidence of various cancers. And you can see brain tumors is not the highest incidence. Prostate, breast, and lung are the highest incidence. But all these other cancers also go to the brain, as highlighted in red. And so we are dealing with more and more brain cancer in the U.S. as well. And as the population ages in the United States as well as around the world, the incidence of primary brain tumor goes up, meningiomas and, and gliomas. And that's shown here. As you get into your 60s and 70s, there's a uh, rapid increase in the incidence of uh, brain tumors. So we'll have to deal with this problem more and more as the whole population ages in, around the world. Is there a timer, by the way? 10, 20, 16. So, um, so what, what are the outcomes? I told you it's not very good. And really what we try to do with these brain tumors is to take out as much as you can safely, called maximal surgical resection. And then we give radiation and chemotherapy uh, afterwards for at least one year. And you can see in the blue line that the survival is better if you do chemotherapy and radiation than, than just radiation alone. So this has been the standard of care for the past many, many decades and confirmed in this 2005 study with a new drug called Temidar or Temozolamide. There's also, if you got, you're probably surprised to know, there's actually a device approved for brain cancer that patients wear. It it's, uh, uses alternating electrical fields. Uh, this is a very innovative devi device developed out of uh, Israel and patients put it on as shown in this picture and wear it 24 seven and they're getting basically electricity going through the tumor and that disrupts tumor cell division and uh, prevents tumor growth. And that was approved in 2011 in the United States, although it was approved earlier in Europe. There was a bigger study done and I'll, and I'll be very, very quick, that was done internationally across many sites and the bottom line is, um, as I'll show you here, when you combine that electrical field with standard chemotherapy, you see a significant improvement in survival as shown in the blue line compared to the, to the red line. So this may become the next standard of care uh, and uh, by the end of this year in terms of using this device along with chemotherapy for brain tumors. So this, this device combined with um, Temidar increased progression-free survival and overall survival. So all, you saw that things can improve, but patients ultimately still end up dying a few years later. The survival is about 30, 20, 25 to 30 percent at two years. So we still have a long way to go. And one of the reasons uh, this type of brain tumor is very difficult is because each patient has a different type of tumor even though it's labeled glioblastoma on histology, pathology, when you look at the genetics, what are the mutations, each patient's tumor is different. So it's every patient is a unique tumor, essentially. And here's a list of uh, mutations that are found in various patients' tumors that have been documented in the Cancer Genome Atlas in the last decade. That's been many publications about the genetics of these tumors. So how can we use this information? One of the focus that we have in the lab is to try to understand that variability of genetics and picking the right drug for the right patient called personalized medicine or precision medicine. And this goes back to a, a, a disease called CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, which there was one genetic mutation that causes that disease. And there was a drug called Gleevec or imatinib that was developed about 15, 20 years ago. And that disease was deadly. Everyone died within one year. But when you, develop, when you made a drug that attacked that genetic mutation, everyone survived. Everyone has a normal lifespan now. So everyone you know, thought personalized medicine, precision medicine would cure all cancers. And we've tested these in gliomas over the past decade, but most of them have not worked is the bottom line. 99% haven't worked. And that's because, as I showed you earlier, it's not one mutation. It's many mutations that occur in these tumors. And that's why we have not been successful. But, you know, we do see responders, as shown here. On the left side, you see patients whose tumor grew after the standard treatment. And on the right side, after treatment with the drugs listed, uh, erlotinib or rapamycin or bevacizumab. And you can see that we do have responders. It's just very low response rate, 10% to 30%. 30% is actually high, and that's why bevacizumab is an approved drug 
for glioblastoma at recurrence. We also have a pediatric brain tumor where there's a specific mutation called TSC, tuber sclerosis complex. So these patients only have one mutation and a drug called Everlimus was developed for that mutation. And when you do that, even though it's a brain tumor, it's a slow growing brain tumor, but these patients uniformly have a 100% response rate because they have one gene abnormality, not two or five or 100. And so even in the brain, you can get good responses if you get the right drug or combination of drugs. But the problem in glioblastoma is that it's very, each person's tumor, as I mentioned, is very different. And this is a, a map uh, of all the genes on the y-axis and each patient's tumor on the x-axis. And you can see that every patient's tumor looks a little different, although there's groups of tumors, as you can, as you, as you can see. So maybe there are patient subsets that responds differently to different drugs. And that's really what we're trying to do, is to identify those subsets and uh, see how they do. Let me just skip a little bit. And that's really been the focus in the lab, is to can we understand who responds and can we do better clinical trials? Because if we don't know who's going to respond and we just give the drug to everyone, we'll get a very low response rate. So one of the, the reasons I was interested in this is that many years ago, I saw this patient before Avastin was available on the left side that had a glioblastoma that recurred several times and didn't respond to any of the drugs. And we were thinking about hospice care at the time, but he wanted to keep trying. And so we gave that drug for CML called imatinib. And imatinib, um, actually a month later, the patient had this amazing shrinkage of tumor, as you can all tell. And we couldn't figure, we, initially we didn't know why he responded because the drug was not supposed to work. And uh, to make a long story short, we studied the patient's tumor in the lab. And over the last six, seven years, we figured out why he responded. And about six years, and we made cell lines, that's the lab data here. And in the cell lines, we can see uh, the reason why the patient responded. We could actually engineer it in the, in the lab and study it and make a model for the patient essentially. And, um, and this is the rationale that we had to do a clinical trial that we're still continuing at UCSD, where we pick patients that have this marker, and only 10% of the patients have the marker, and then we include those patients in a clinical trial with the drug, so that we get rid of all the noise of patients who would never have responded to the drug. And we have a reasonable response rate right now, and uh, hopefully we'll res report some positive results in the next year or so. And that, that idea keeps playing out, uh, as I'll show you, that we need to understand what drives a tumor, and then we need to pick the right drugs. Here's a pediatric tumor. Uh, it's called medulloblastoma. Um, and this particular type of tumor, a subset, is driven by a pathway called hedgehog. And uh, Genentech developed a drug called GDC0449. And you can see on the left side a patient who has metastatic disease on a PET scan. All the, all the black dots are cancer and throughout the whole body, mainly in the bone. And you can see six weeks later with treatment of this drug for this patient who had the marker had a tremendous response within six weeks. We, we never used to see things like this in the past. But resistance occurs very quickly. So a patient responds today, but the cancer can stop responding within a few weeks or a few months. And that was shown in the same case I didn't show earlier. On the right figure, you can see the tumor came back another six weeks later. And when they biopsied one of the lesions, it was, there was a mutation in the tumor that's shown on the right. So cancer is a very rapid disease, evolves very quickly, and we have to understand what's happening to the tumor uh, as we're treating the patient because it's literally changing in front of us. The other problem that we have in neuro-oncology is that we, many of the drugs that, um, that uh, wor work in the body don't work in the brain. Anyone know why? The blood-brain barrier. So many of the drugs that we make in, uh, in the you know, pharmaceutical companies, don't, the drugs don't get into the brain. There's a blood-brain barrier that limits access of drugs. It's a protective thing, and we've learned that many of the drugs that we're using in clinical trials 
don't get into the brain. So probably 80, 90% of the problem is most drugs don't get into the brain. That's why we're not successful. But when you can give drugs adequately by different methods, like increasing the dose, et cetera, it's hard to see on this slide, uh, but bottom line is at the top figure, the patient's tumor grew. When I increase the dose above the normally approved doses, we can get more into the spinal fluid and we can see a response. Very, very simple. You just need to get enough drug into the brain. And we've known this from a disease called lymphoma, uh, which, you know, lymphoma below the neck and the body is curable with standard chemotherapy called CHOP. And um, lymphoma in the brain is deadly several decades ago until we figured out if we give really high doses of methotrexate or other drugs that get into the brain, we can essentially cure these patients of their lymphoma. We don't need to use radiation. We don't need to do surgery. We just need to do biopsy, and we're, we know what to do right after that. So our focus really has been to develop clinical trials focused in, upon understanding each patient's tumor and uh, developing trials uh, based on these biomarkers and really do what we talk about, which is precision or personalized medicine. But you really need a team to do it. One of the things, all this data I've showed you is, is, is only due to because of pathologists, oncologists, surgeons, and scientists who can study these patients and tissues in a collaborative way to really you know, push the field forward, and, and, and that's what we try to do. We're also, in terms of collaborations, we also work with a lot of companies to get their drugs and do clinical trials with them. And so I think that's a very important part of doing medicine these days and pushing the envelope is to be able to collaborate with, uh, within the institution and also outside the institution with both academics and non-academics. I'll show you some of the more exciting drugs that we're working with. This is tax, have you guys ever heard of Taxol? Which is a natural product, right? And it's a chemotherapy drug used for breast cancer. It doesn't get into the brain very well. But this company called Angiochem made Taxol and put it on a protein that gets across the blood-brain barrier. And when they've done that in previous studies and in a study that we're still running at UCSD, you can see, given the drug to this patient with a brain tumor, over time, we can actually see shrinkage of the tumor. So a drug that shouldn't work in brain tumors, you get it into the brain, and we can see responses. I'm just giving a few examples of, uh, here's another drug called G202, which is another natural product called Tapsigargan, which is found in the Mediterranean. And um, it's very toxic if you try to give it by itself. It'll, it'll kill you. But this company called Genspera made a pro drug out of it. So they covered the, the toxin with the peptide that makes it non-toxic. And that peptide is cleaved by a specific enzyme found in the tumor blood vessels called PSMA. And you can see on the top right, the, normal, the top left, the brain doesn't express PSMA, but the tumors express PSMA in the blood vessels as in the brown staining. And when we give it to patients, you can see in the bottom there, this particular patient had a shrinkage of tumor at one month. So these are some of the exciting uh, things that we're trying to do in terms of understanding basically each patient's tumor, under trying to do clinical trials and trying to get new drugs for these patients. And then as we treat the patients, we try to st get their tissues like I'm showing here and try to understand what markers predict response to treatments. And so, you know, it really is only done in collaboration. You can't do it in isolation. And this really involves companies, academics, um, and even uh, nonprofits that help fund some of these clinical trials uh, for brain tumors that uh, companies don't really focus on because it's a much smaller disease than lung or breast cancer. So we we try to get help from anyone that can help us uh, do these trials for these patients. So I'm going to stop there. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I could talk about, but that would take another two hours, and I don't, we don't have that much time. But you know, really, as I mentioned before, we're really focused on making a difference, and uh, our team is built upon utilizing everything we can to develop new drugs, find a cure, and improve outcomes, meaning the side effects of our treatments, et cetera. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions now or later.
later. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kesari. Um, so, uh, please reserve your questions later. Okay, so we will move on to our next brain tumor speaker. <laughs> brain tumor. Uh, he is, uh, our next speaker is an assistant professor of neurosciences and neuro-oncology and director of the clinical neuro-oncology at the Morse Cancer, Cancer Center, University of California, San Diego. Uh, he specializes in primary and metastatic tumors of the brain and nervous system, as well as neurological complications of cancer. He obtained his MD and a PhD in neuroscience at the State University of New York at Buffalo. His postdoctoral training included a neurology residency at the University of California, Los Angel Angeles, <laughs> as well as fellowship in clinical pharmacology and neuro-oncology, also at UCLA. His research interests include translating research discoveries into novel treatments and clinical trials, as well as determining markers of treatment response. He focuses on molecular and genetic profiling of individual tumors and using this knowledge to develop personalized target therapy. Uh, let's welcome Dr. David Piquion. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for having me come here and speak with you today. Um, let's make sure we got the microphone adjusted first. Okay, there we go. So, uh, my name is Dr. Piccioni. I'm a neuro oncologist. So, like Dr. Casey that you uh, just heard from, I specialize in the treatment of brain tumors, uh, and we both uh, work very closely together um, to sort of translate. Uh, research outcomes into, you know, improved therapies and improved uh, patient outcomes. So uh, from this session, I want to just touch base a little bit and uh, have you know about sort of basics of brain tumors, sort of the basic management of, of treating brain tumors and some of the sort of nursing implications in the, related to the care of patients with brain tumors and, and other CNS tumors. So brain tumors can either be from cancer elsewhere in the body that metastasizes and spreads to the brain, or they can be primary brain tumors that really start in the brain and stay in the brain. Most of what we actually deal with are uh, brain metastases, our other cancers such as lung cancer and breast cancer that is a late part of the disease spread throughout the body and one of the places they spread is the brain. Um, you know, as more patients, more people are getting cancer because we're doing other things in terms of health, in terms of treating health disease and other medical conditions that keep people alive longer. And so as people live longer, then they have a higher chance of getting a disease like cancer. And so the incidence of cancer and brain metastases is higher. Second of all, we're also doing good job as oncologists in general, and we're keeping people alive with different kinds of cancer longer. And as people live longer with different kinds of cancer, then um, the chance of that cancer somehow spreading in the body and spreading to the brain is higher, and more people end up with brain metastases as well. Um, the primary tumors of the brain, the gliomas are the main ones, are tumors from brain tissue. So either the glial cells of the brain, like the astrocytes or the oligodendroglioma, or the oligodendroglial cells that give support and structure to the brain and support the neurons or the covering of the brain like the meninges, these primary brain tumors usually start in the brain and stay in the brain. Because of that, they don't have the same language we use to describe regular cancer. So other cancers really talk about stage. Um, 
which is really sort of how far it's spread. If it's just spread locally in the organ, if it's spread locally in that surrounding area, such as the pelvis or metastasized. But because primary brain tumors really start in the brain and stay in the brain, they don't have that language of staging. They only have grade, which is really how aggressive or malignant something looks, how fast it's growing, how much um, new blood vessels it's recruiting into it to kind of feed it and provide it with support. So primary brain tumors are very different than, um, than other cancers that we talk about, and that we only really talk about them in terms of grade. So um, in terms of the different primary brain tumors, so not talking about the brain metastases now, uh, you can see this breakdown of them here. The largest portion of them there in the, in the bottom right is really the meningiomas, those coming from the meninges or the coverings of the brain. And those are, for the most part, fairly benign tumors. And I'm not going to talk too much about those today. The gliomas uh, occur from the supporting brain tissue, and those are a different story. Well, those have a bunch of different grades to them, um, from sort of more benign to more malignant, but in fact, they all eventually slowly progress through the grading system. So a grade two glioma will become a grade three glioma, will become a grade four a glioblastoma, which is the most um, malignant and aggressive type. So even though we give it a, a, a less malignant grade in terms of a grade two tumor, um, really it's going to become aggressive with time. It's just going to take a lot longer to do that. So really the malignant tumors are the gliomas and of those, a majority of them, 53% are the glioblastoma or the grade four, the most malignant type. And in the United States, there's only about 10,000 cases of this per year. So that's a small fraction of the primary, of the brain tumors we see, whereas there are hundreds of thousands of cases of brain metastases uh, that we might see in a given year. But most of our research interests are actually focused on the tumors of the nervous system, those gliomas that start in the brain and stay in the brain. So what we're learning about now is really we can define these different grades of gliomas sort of by their genetic features. And while Dr. Kayseri showed you that each person's tumor is a little different and there are individualized approaches to them, there's also some overarching themes um, that go from the different grades. So the grade one tumors we see are actually ones, grade one tumors usually just stay grade one, whereas the grade twos actually progress up through three and four like I talked about. The grade one tumors have this mutation called this BRAF fusion that occurs. Um, the grade two and three tumors start with this IDH1 mutation, and then they either develop this 1P19Q deletion, and those happen in the oligodendroglial tumors, or they don't have the 1P19Q deletion, and those are the asterisk cytoma or astrocytic tumors, and they both, as said, eventually progress along to glioblastoma. There's also primary glioblastoma, which has its own set of genetic features to it uh, that's the most aggressive type, survival only being about 16 months from diagnosis, and uh, is really the most aggressive and incurable type of brain tumor that we have. So what are some kind of common features and symptoms of brain tumors? Well, if you think of the skull as basically sort of a rigid box that's kind of already filled with the brain and, spi and spinal fluid and blood, and then you put a tumor in there and it grows, it's going to push and displace everything else. And so the first thing that causes is pressure. So tumors themselves cause pressure, and then the body's response to the tumor is swelling or cerebral edema, and that also causes an even larger area of, of high pressure. And so you get this increased intracranial pressure is often a very early... Uh, symptom of a rapidly expanding brain tumor. So this can sort of irritate the cortex and the brain and that can lead to seizures um, or you can have symptoms based just on the pressure or you can have symptoms based on whichever part of the brain that this mass is occurring in. So really brain tumors have general symptoms which are symptoms of the pressure that are things like headache, confusion and that eventually can progress to stupor or coma and even death if the pressure gets big and bigger, larger and larger. Uh, there's seizures, which can either be generalized seizures, like a tonic-clonic seizure, or a focal seizure, such as a focal motor seizure occurring just in one arm or in one area of the, of the body. And then this has mental status changes. So, you know, confusion from the 
generalized brain dysfunction from the increased pressure. You can also have focal neurologic signs based on where that tumor and that pressure is. So things that occur in the brainstem affect the cranial nerves. So you'll see things with facial droop, problems with eye movements, difficulty swallowing. There's really even less room in the brainstem than there is in the brain in terms of areas for things to expand. And people can get symptomatic and sick and then comatose very quickly. You know, if there are uh, tumors in the left temporal or frontal lobe, they can affect speech and give you aphasia. If you have things in the motor strip or the other parts of the frontal lobe, you can affect strength and they'd lead to weaken focal weakness or focal sensory loss if they're in the parietal lobe. In the occipital lobes of the brain, um, you can get you have vision, and so a problem there gives you a vision loss, as well as in the temporal lobe, because the vision fibers come from the eyes through the optic chiasm back through the temporal lobes to get to the occipital lobe, which is in the back of the brain. So anywhere along there can really give you a problem um, with vision. The tumor I wanted to talk the most about is the most aggressive type, the glioblastoma, which I said before is sort of incurable and really has an average survival of only about 16 months or so. So here's the standard of care therapy. This is the most sort of aggressive therapy um, we take for these sort of tumors. The first step is surgical resection, so trying to remove as much of the tumor as possible. You can never get 100% of these tumors out. Um, it, they have a diffuse nature to them, so it's, an, it's a weaving of normal brain and tumor, and that's sort of spread throughout a large area of the brain, so you get the bulk of the tumor out, but there's little tendrils that always stay behind. After you do surgery, you do radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, the chemotherapy is the temidar or temozolomide chemotherapy that Dr. Kayseri mentioned. And this is done daily for six weeks with radiation. So six weeks of daily radiation and daily pill chemotherapy with the temidar, followed by six monthly cycles of, of the temozolomide chemotherapy. After that, we take a break, and that usually stops the tumor from growing for a while. But eventually, these tumors do come back. And we look at other clinical trials or other treatment options during this time. And then finally, uh, when tumor comes back, there's a therapy called Avastin or Bevacizumab, which is an antibody therapy that attacks tumor blood vessels. So tumors cause the body to grow new blood vessels to feed them, to supply them with oxygen and nutrients. And one strategy for attacking many different types of cancer is using this Bevacizumab, which is an antibody that uh, blocks new blood vessel growth. And this works for some time in brain tumors, but eventually tumors do mutate. They find a way around it. And um, at that point, we, don't, we have very limited treatment options. So this was a slide that you also saw earlier, but basically showing the benefit of adding chemotherapy to radiation. So up until about 2005, the only thing we had for glioblastoma that we knew worked was surgery and radiation. And you can see that in the red line. So this is showing survival. So this is 100% of the people still alive. And then this is how long they live for across the bottom. And you see about half of them have passed away at about 12 months or so. And then when you add chemotherapy, you add a number of months to that. And some of them are long-term survivors, but the numbers are very low in the 20% or less. When we look at other tumors, I talked earlier about those oligodendrogliomas that have this 1P19Q uh, chromosomal deletion, um, and they do very well and respond to chemotherapy. And you can see here that um, the blue line is radiation alone, and the yellow line is radiation with chemotherapy. They have a different kind of chemotherapy called PCV chemotherapy, which is a combination of three different chemotherapies, uh, procarbazine for the P, CCNU for the C and Vincristine for the V. And you can see here the scale on the, on the uh, x-axis is very different. So back here in the, in the glioblastoma in the grade four tumors, we saw that this scale is in months and it only goes out to about three, you know, 36 months or three years. Whereas when we look at the grade three tumors, you can see this scale is in years and you see patients living out to 10 and 12 years with 50% of them or more still alive. So a very different prognosis based on the grade of the tumor, but still not something that we think is, is curable. Um, and so again, this sort of highlights the trials that we've done to show that radiation alone um, can be improved upon with, with chemotherapy. 
Now, this was also mentioned in the earlier lecture, this Novacure or Optune device, which is sort of a um, something that is brand new in the treatment of glioblastoma. And because of its success, the company is actually looking to treat other different kinds of cancer with it. And some people call, talk about this as the fourth treatment modality for cancer. So when you have cancer, the first thing you can do is surgery, like we talked about. And then radiation is your second treatment. And chemotherapy is your third. And now this is a fourth kind of treatment that's unlike any of the other three. And it's based on a principle of alternating electric fields. So whenever a cell has to divide, it has to build a scaffold um, of cytoskeletal uh, filaments, which are all charged particles. And then it lines up all its chromosomes and its organelles and all the things inside the cell. And then it, the cell divides and pulls that into two new daughter cells. Well, to maintain that scaffold, you, uh, you need to maintain a constant electric field because all those scaffolding particles are actually charged. And if you put an alternating electric field through there, you shear apart that scaffolding, making it so a tumor cell can't sort all of its DNA and all of its organelles into two different cells and split them in two. And so this is something that needs to be constantly present. You need to have this alternating electric field there all the time. Um, but it's a way to sort of stop tumor cells from dividing that isn't surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. So here's, an, here's a picture of a cell dividing going through cytokinesis and then going to a new cell. And it shows where in the green arrows, when the cell is starting to split into two, this is where the alternating electrical field works and prevents the cell from doing that. So there were pictures of this in the other talk as well, but this is, uh, this is electrical pads that you actually apply to the head. Um, they're giant stickers really almost with uh, little generators on them and they create an electrical field that goes through the brain and this large battery that it's attached to is what creates the, uh, the electric field. You see that patients wear this around. Here's a person in a supermarket. Uh, he's wearing a hat over his head so you can't see the device and he has the battery in sort of a large bag here that he carries with him. But he can be out and about and do his, his daily routine. Actually, when I was in the airport in Hawaii on a uh, connecting flight on the way over here, there was another patient in the airport who was walking through the airport wearing one of these. So I knew he had a glioblastoma and that he had the treatment, but he was actually traveling um, you know, with his device on. So this study, uh, actually, um, there were two studies. One was a study just to show it in, in tumors that came back. And this is what it led to its first FDA approval. And what they did was when they ran out of, or they got near the end of the line for treatment options for glioblastoma, the oncologist either picked a chemotherapy that he thought would be the best choice, or they put on just this device. And they showed... Um, they showed that it was equal, that just this device alone without any other treatment was just as good as any chemotherapy you could come up with. And furthermore, quality of life was better. And they actually got more people whose tumors shrank using just the device. So this, got, this led to its uh, approval and people started using it. And here's another picture of somebody using it. And I just want to talk for a little bit Really, the only complication of this device is sort of sores on the head sometimes. Because of the pads are sticky like tape or glue, and they're on the head all the time, sometimes that leads to skin irritation and leads to skin breakdown. And sometimes then you have to take a break from using it or move the pads a little bit so you have those areas that heal up. But really, this is something that's as good as chemotherapy in this case, and really the only side effect, there's no nausea or, or you know drop in the blood counts or fatigue, it's really just potentially some, some sores on the head. And here's a picture of this actually showing tumor shrinkage, where you can see here across the top, the tumor starts out big and over six to 12 months, it kind of slowly shrinks with time. Now, trials like this require hundreds of patients who have a rare tumor type, like a glioblastoma. And so to do a clinical trial, uh, these have to often be large, um, collaborative multinational uh, efforts. And Dr. Casey was actually one of the lead authors on this study, which he um, 
did not point out when he was talking, but uh, being very modest. But uh, one of the bigger, big, largest enrollers of patients on this, uh, this study, and this study actually did something else. It combined the radiation and chemotherapy that we knew about with the device. So instead of waiting for the tumor to come back, they did everything at the beginning. They did their surgery, then they did their radiation, and then as soon as the radiation ended, they started their chemotherapy and they put the device on. And in this case, they actually showed that people lived longer when you were doing this. And so again, to kind of figure out what the best thing to do is for these kind of tumors takes a lot of sort of collaboration and research and very large scale clinical trials that require lots of cooperation and collaboration. So if you look at glioblastoma over the years, first, if you did just surgery for this type of tumor, it grows back and the patient dies within about three months. If you did just radiation, patients last about 12 months on average. But uh, when you did the radiation and the chemotherapy, then it got to 15 months. And then if you did the surgery and the radiation and the chemotherapy and this device, now we're up to 19 months. And so they're small, they're small steps, but as people work together, they sort of improve the care and improve the survival and improve the treatments of these patients. Furthermore, these are all averages, and there's always patients who do well or live a long time. We do have a glioblastoma patient who's alive 20 years later, um, but it's just a rare thing. And so, so you can't always just go by the, by the average numbers. What I wanted to end with was just talking about brain tumors and sort of the nursing implications in terms of taking care of these patients and the unique challenges that they face. So when patients have their surgeries or when they have uh, brain tumors, a lot of times they have a lot of swelling. And so one thing that gets done a lot is steroids and usually dexamethasone or decadron is the steroid of choice, which is the best one for bringing down cerebral edema or brain swelling. But we have to remember that any treatment we do has side effects that go with it. And so steroids, especially high dose steroids, cause a lot of insomnia, agitation. People can become psychotic all of a sudden. When you're on them for a long time, you gain weight, um, really rapid weight gain. Um, and then, of course, there's hyperphagia, lots of eating that goes on to accompany that. These brain tumor patients have seizures, and sometimes before surgery, most of the neurosurgeons put people on anti-seizure medications. But anti-seizure medications can make people tired or fatigued or dizzy. And then furthermore, when patients are on steroid medications in the long term, you have to think about other things it causes, causes osteoporosis, it causes um, uh, bleeding ulcers in the stomach if you're not on some sort of stomach prophylaxis, like a proton pump inhibitor or a H2 blocker. And so those are all things you have to worry about. So right after surgery, you know, the nurses have to be aware to sort of watch for more increased intracranial pressure. If they say new rapid uh, deterioration, very bad headache, very bad confusion. That could be bleeding after the surgery, sort of mimicking a tumor, or that could be swelling that's taking place and the patient needs more steroids. And so frequent neurologic exams to make sure the patient isn't deteriorating after surgery is needed. Um, you know, you need to provide wound care, coughing and deep breathing as people recover from the anesthesia, start to increase their activity. Brain surgery is actually a lot quicker to recover from than, say, abdominal surgery, where when you have abdominal surgery, you're cutting through all the layers of the muscle and have a lot of healing and abdominal pain and discomfort. Because the brain's sort of fixed in the skull and there's not nerves inside the skull and the brain to feel pain, you're really just worried about the sensation. Once all that gets sewn back up, there might be incisional pain, but the patient can actually recover their, and gain their mobility within a few days and get back up and about and moving around. You know, all cancer patients and all patients who are um, not ambulatory, you have to worry about DVTs and, and, and pulmonary emboli, emboli. And then, of course, anyone who's just had surgery, you worry about seizures and they're on medications for seizure precautions. So the next step after a glioblastoma patient gets his surgery is, um, is really the radiation and chemotherapy that follow. And f side effects you have during that radiation and chemotherapy are fatigue, the fatigue usually is cumulative with radiation. So in your six weeks of radiation, you start out and you don't really have fatigue. And then about the third or fourth week, it starts to set in and kind of slowly get worse and worse over the six weeks and then hang around for a few weeks afterwards before it goes away. 
So letting patients know that some of that is normal. You get hair loss, especially at the site of radiation, but the temozolomide chemotherapy doesn't cause widespread hair loss in the rest of the body. You can get skin irritation from the radiation, which is almost like a sunburn over that area. And then sometimes during treatment, the body responds to those dying tumor cells with even more swelling. And then you have to worry about all the things for edema and increased intracranial pressure and the cognitive changes that happen with that. So headaches that occur with treatment are usually pressure related. You don't want to cover those up with narcotics. You want to fix the underlying problem and get steroids to sort of lower the, bring the swelling down and get the patient feeling better. As we do long-term chemotherapy over the next six to 12 months, you have to worry about bone marrow suppression, low blood counts, nausea, which we can usually cover up with anti-nausea medications. Constipation is actually much more frequent in the brain tumor population because the nausea medicines and the chemotherapy are actually very constipating. So they usually don't get abdominal pain or diarrhea, but constipation is something that we have to address and make sure they are uh, routinely moving their bowels. So some of the last thing I wanted to sort of uh, finish on the next couple slides is some of the chemotherapies that we use and some of, and their common side effects. So brain tumors use very specific chemotherapies, things that have to cross the blood-brain barrier. So they're things that we don't often use in other cancers. Um, temozolomide is the main one that we use that really covers low blood counts, fatigue, and nausea. And we can usually, um, you know, treat the fatigue and nausea, either with stimulants for the fatigue or anti-nausea medications for the nausea. Um, not a lot you can do for the low blood counts. Sometimes you have to back off the treatment if the blood counts are too low. The other medications we use for brain tumors like lomustine and carboplatin have a sort of similar side effect profile. Um, again, constipation is what we watch for. And then um, there's a high incidence of pneumocystis pneumonia when they're immunosuppressed from the chemotherapy, and we often do um, prophylax them for that with antibiotics such as Bactrim. Uh, arenotecan is another chemotherapy we sometimes use for brain tumors that really has a very bad side effect of diarrhea in about 20% of the patients, and so we try to use loperamide to control that. Bevacizumab I talked about earlier is really, really well tolerated. It's antibodies and water essentially is what it is. It's an IV therapy. So like antibodies in your bloodstream, it'd be just giving you a bag of water and antibodies. It's usually pretty well tolerated going in. Um, because it affects blood vessels, it does have a bunch of complications that are rare but serious, such as bleeding, bleeding in the colon, blood clots such as uh, DVTs or pulmonary embolus or you know bleeding in the brain or the site of the tumor that can be serious or fatal, but the actual administration is usually otherwise pretty well tolerated. When you do it for a long time, it does have some proteinuria from the kidneys, some loss of protein that happens from the kidneys becoming sort of leaky and not reabsorbing the protein, as well as some uh, high blood pressure that occurs, but those are things that can be monitored and treated. We do usually save bevacizumab therapy for the end uh, in treating patients with a brain tumor, and that's because it brings down the swelling really bad. So eventually a tumor starts growing and other treatments and other chemotherapies don't work. And so you get lots of brain swelling and lots of edema and lots of symptoms. And so bevacizumab works even better than the steroids to bring down the brain swelling. So you can see here, especially on these bottom two pictures, the one on the left is before the bevacizumab, and you see the large white area of swelling in the left side of the brain. Um, whereas after the bevacizumab, you can see that the swelling's brought down considerably. And this patient was almost comatose before she got the bevacizumab. And then a few weeks later, she actually walked into the clinic just fine, not even using a cane or a walker, went to her son's football game. Um, because she was doing so much better, uh, now all that swelling and pressure had been relieved in the brain. And so bevacizumab is a good thing to really help with quality of life near the end of, of care for patients with brain tumors. So there's other things to address with patients such as, um, you know, teaching them the risks of, you know, watching for blood clots, DVTs, watching for a swollen limb, teach them, you know, if they have a sudden neurologic change, that could be, uh, you know, seizure, 
And if they're having neurologic decline in things like personality, weakness, vision, speech, then you're worried more about tumor growth and to really educate the family about what will be coming in these patients so that they know what to do and they can get interventions. The problem with brain tumors is that it affects your thinking and your cognition and your awareness. And so the patient often might not understand what's going on with him or understand that he's declining. And you really need the family to come recruit them and help them and talk to them and get them to talk to you and, and let you know when there's decline. You know, unlike other cancers, like I said, the brain tumors cause these mental changes that, you know, perhaps lose driving privileges. In the United States, we have to, uh, if somebody has a, a seizure where they lose consciousness, we have to suspend their driver's license. They, know, they might have bad judgment based on where their brain tumor is. You have to get the family involved in terms of taking care of all the legal affairs, making sure that their will is made out or they have a power of attorney or they have someone to make medical decisions for them when they're impaired because this is sort of a rapid, um, a rapid tumor. And then brain tumors often have caregiver fatigue. You know, these patients uh, require a lot of work on the family's behalf and sometimes it can become overwhelming for them. And letting them know what's coming can often help them plan ahead and come up with a strategy to, to take care of their loved one. And then for most part, um, eventually patients do succumb to this illness and getting hospice and palliative care involved is important. And so this treatment really is designed to give them quality of life for however long it works for, whether it's 16 months or shorter or longer or much longer, but to give them good quality because the tumor will come back eventually. And then when they do start to decline, start to make them comfortable with, with hospice and palliative care. Um, and bevacizumab, like I said, can help with that because at the very end, it can help improve them a little bit um, and give them some quality of life. So I will thank you very much for your attention and uh, I will save questions for the end and uh, I will have our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Piccioni. Uh, I think w what we most understand right now as nurses is the nursing implications for brain tumors and taking care of patients with brain tumors, right? Uh, I'd also like to, I think Dean Boot is also pleased to know that uh, in making, in developing chemotherapies or in the treatment of brain tumors, we also use ecology and the environment. <laughs> however, however, some chemotherapies are also um, dangerous, no? So... Uh, let's move on to our next speaker on patient-centered outcomes, focusing on the patient. He's actually the reason why we have this activity right now. And thanks to him, he came, uh, Dr. Spicconi and Dr. Um, Kisari is here right now, are here right now. Okay, so... He is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and as an advanced practice nurse researcher in the neuro-oncology program at the Moore's Cancer Center, University of California, San Diego. He obtained his bachelor's degree in nursing at uh, University of the Philippines and his master's degree in nursing at UCLA, where he is currently a PhD candidate. He is the faculty in charge of the oncology course uh, at the Faculty of Management and Development Studies at the UP Open University. It's none other than Marlon Garza Saria, soon to be a doctor. Thank you, Queenie. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UP Open University for inviting me once again here uh, in the Los Banos campus to see you all. This is the second time that I am here. The first time was in January. And when I came here to visit, uh, one of your professors actually pulled me in to help teach with one of the courses. So now this is my second time here. I wonder what else she has in store for me uh, to, to help the program. But I'll be more than happy to help. 
And as you can see, uh, I even brought a real experts in neuro-oncology here, physicians, scientists, who are helping move the science and uh, the practice forward, uh, when, especially when we talk about brain tumors. So Dr. Casey, we said that I will be talking about patient outcomes, but I decided last minute to change my topic uh, to one that we, or a lot of the nurses, can actually make an impact on, and that's adherence, oral adherence. When we talk about chemotherapy, what have you learned in school? Many of us are still talking about the old traditional chemotherapy drugs, right? Given intravenously. And that's the first thing that we think of. Every time someone says chemotherapy, the first thing you think is IV. And no one thinks about the oral drugs. But if you think about the research that's happening right now, and even in clinical practice, we see more and more oral drugs, oral agents being prescribed. Many of them are called small molecules. Uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but we have also traditional chemotherapy drugs, and we have mentioned one drug uh, that is the standard of care for brain tumors, temodar, temozolamide. It's a pill that we give our patients. The problem is patients are not taking the drugs, which would make you re really wonder why. Uh, and I will show you a lot of the details about that. In terms of the outcomes, uh, initially I was thinking about giving a talk on all these things, clinical endpoints, you know, signs and symptoms. We as nurses look at symptoms uh, either of the cancer itself or of cancer treatment. We look at the severity of the symptom or maybe the frequency of the symptom. We have a lot of symptom instruments that we can use. Uh, in the United States, you know, there's the MD Anderson Symptom Inventory. The National Cancer Institute has their own. So there's a lot to choose from uh, that, that we could use to actually measure these symptoms. We can also look at lab values uh, in terms of for the clinical endpoints. If you have a patient with lymphoma, you look at LDH to see if the patient is responding to the drug. Uh, but more importantly for the other cancers, uh, you could look at biomarkers. You know, you can draw a lab, you can draw blood, and look at the biomarkers to see if the patient is responding to the treatment that they're getting, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation therapy, biologic therapy, or uh, the new therapies that we're using for brain tumor. Uh, survival, we see that a lot. You've seen the talks given by our to physician scientists, we look at survival. So disease-free survival, so that's the time from when the patient started on the clinical trial or the patient started taking the drug up to the point where they actually progress from the cancer, the cancer gets worse. And then there's overall survival as well, which is not used as much because it's not very sensitive to the treatment that they're getting. Overall survival is from the time the patient is taking the drug to the time they die. So what happens if a patient on chemotherapy goes outside and gets hit by a bus? <laughs> then the overall survival is shorter. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's because of the treatment, but because they died. And that's why we don't use overall survival that much as opposed to uh, disease-free survival in clinical trials. Functional status. We look at physical. Uh, you have the Karnofsky scale. I think many of you are familiar with the Karnofsky scale, 0 to 10, and 0 to 100, or the ECOG scale, uh, 0 to 5. Mental, uh, hospital anxiety and depression scale. We have a lot of instruments that looks at uh, psychological uh, assessment for patients. And the social. There's a lot of instruments out there that you could use social support. And then I'm sure a lot of you, especially if you work in a hospital that's applying for joint commission status here in the Philippines, if you work for St. Luke's or Makati Med, I'm not sure if the Philippine General Hospital is applying for that as well. Uh, Medical City. So these are some of the outcomes that they're looking at. Nursing sensitive quality indicators. They look at patient falls, patient falls with injury, pressure ulcers, uh, nursing satisfaction, staff mix, restraint use, uh, peripheral intravenous infiltration. So what are all those things? Instruments. Basically, we are measuring the outcomes. We are measuring the outcomes so that we could tell if we're actually making a difference clinically or uh, institutionally, depending on what kinds of outcomes we're looking. Measurements are key. If you can't measure it, you cannot control it. If you cannot control it, then you cannot manage it. And if you cannot manage it, then you cannot improve it. So it's very important that we measure the outcome so that we will know where we're at. That's attributed to Harrington. Uh, Peter Drucker, I think, is uh, a very prolific writer on outcomes, and he made this really short. He just basically said, if you can't measure it, you can't evaluate it. And then another quote attributed from Einstein, to Einstein, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. 
So what does he mean by that? You know, a lot of researchers are looking at instruments. You know, they gather lots and lots and lots of data, and what happens to those data? that get stored in the bank, and we don't really do anything with that. So you know, we can count all those, but we're not really using that in clinical practice. And then there are other soft kind of data that we can't really measure. So if we have a patient who whose goal after being diagnosed with cancer is to live six more months to watch their daughter get married or you know, something. I mean, you could measure the lifespan. You could measure how much more months or years they survive after that, but you can't really measure how important that event was for him or her, right? So those are the things that really count for us, really important for us, but we can't measure that. So how can we say that the therapy actually helped that patient meet his or her goal? to be uh, in attendance at his or her daughter's wedding, there's no way to measure. You can measure the number of days, you can measure the months, but the importance of that event to that patient, we can't really measure. So there are those things, unfortunately, that we can't measure that are important. Going back to my topic, oral chemo. So Dr. Kayseri, Dr. Piccioni, they're all uh, translational scientists. So this is just a, a figure of the drug development process. You can see it's very complicated, very long. It starts with an idea. So these scientists, they look at targets, possible targets, and then they think of what kinds of molecule can we use to actually hit the target to help cure the cancer or control the cancer. You can see there's exploratory development. It goes through a series of stages, clinical trials, phase one, two, three, four. But before that, they have to do animal studies. That's a very, very long road. So that's a simplified cartoon this is what really happens. Uh, you could see out of 5,000 to 10,000 compounds that are started, ideas, there's only one FDA approved drug that we get from out of those. And if you look at the costs associated with that, well, before I talk about the cost, let's look at the years. Three to six years uh, developing the compounds up to, if you total the years, takes about 15 to 20 years to develop one drug. Very long time, right? So what are the costs associated with 15 to 20 years? Many of our scientists graduate from their PhD or MD program when they're 30. So it takes about 20 years to develop a drug, they'll be 50. So if you're lucky enough to develop a drug, you're at 50 and then you can develop another drug, then you'll be 70. But you can see that it's really a lot of hard work. It really life goes into this. A life of a scientist can be put into just developing one drug. And that's just one of the costs. The other cost is the actual cost, dollars. Do you know how much it costs to develop one drug? Any guess? Millions? How, how? Just guess. 50 million? You're not even close. 800 million to $1 billion to develop one drug. So over the span of 20 years. For me, though, the most important cost is... Uh, the human cost. So yes, we develop a drug, but we need to test it in humans. We need to have the clinical trials. We only have so many patients, and we have so many clinical trials. So all those clinical trials, we need patients. And it's, it's the most important resource for me, the patients that we get enrolled in clinical trials. So if we don't have those patients, we don't have the clinical trials, we don't know which drug will work. So that, for me, is the most important cost, trying to get the patients enrolled in clinical trials, all those uh, subjects that we have. Oral chemo. I told you earlier, I was alluding to, we're still talking about IV chemotherapy every time we talk about chemo. But look at the timeline here. From 1950 to 2000, a span of 10, 20, 30 years that are clumped together. And then all of a sudden, the last 10 years, you just saw boom, like a lot of drugs that have been developed and that have been approved. And, most, and all those drugs are oral drugs. So in the recently, we've seen a lot of oral drugs being developed and being used uh, in clinical practice. And yet, in nursing schools, we still talk about the side effects that we get from the IV drugs. We don't get a lot of education on the biologics and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that you have heard during the first two talks. That's what they all talked about, targeted therapy, oral biologics. We don't hear of that often in school, right? So there I say that if you don't even get a lecture on genetics, on molecular profiling, molecular testing, targeted therapy, then we're really, really behind in times. Because this is where medicine is going to now, especially in cancer care. Now, this is just mostly for uh, to prove a, prove a point. 
not really for you to learn about the details, but uh, basically this chart, which I know you can't read, it's very small uh, and a lot of colors there. Basically what I wanted to show is how the oral drugs are being prescribed. So you can see the trend going up and the costs associated with the drugs. You can see the cost rising. Queenie here has been talking, I mean, we've been having a side conversation while there was a lecture, uh, the lecture was going on earlier and we were talking about the cost of the drugs. And she said, how can patients afford that? That's the problem, they can't. So at least in the United States, sometimes, uh, or for most patients, we have health insurance companies, but even then, they don't always get approved by the insurance companies to be prescribed on those drugs. So let alone here in the Philippines where I think most of the patients are still on self-pay, I, I cannot even comprehend uh, you know, how, how they can afford to, to be on these drugs that we know work. Uh, especially if, like Dr. Kayseri mentioned earlier, if they have the biologic, the marker uh, that, that uh, will make them respond to the drug that we can give them. Oral drugs are prescribed for the treatment of cancer. We've already established that. Uh, includes chemotherapy agents, so Tamadar, at least in the brain tumor world, is what we use. There's also CCNU or Lomastine. I don't know what brand name you may have here. It's also a pill. Uh, we have the small molecule inhibitors that targets the tumor microenvironment. And about 25% of the drugs in the pipeline are all oral, are oral agents. So that's a huge percentage, very different from what the pipeline was, what the new drugs that have not been approved yet uh, about 10 and 20 years ago. We are seeing a very different profile. You've heard that we're trying to call cancer a chronic condition now. So I think the use of oral agents reflect that. And the, the, one, the one disease that I can compare that with is diabetes. What did we have uh, to manage diabetes before in the past? Insulin, right? We only had insulin. If you have diabetes, you get insulin. And now we started getting all the oral anti-diabetic agents and people are more thinking about, yeah, diabetes is not a death sentence, it's more of a chronic disease. Now we're seeing that in cancer. Before we only had the IV chemotherapy drugs, now we're seeing the pills. What does the pill tell us? That yes, I can go home and take the pills and you know, be with cancer for a long time if I take the pills. So we're seeing that the trend. A very good example, not in brain tumors, but in leukemia, is Gleevec. So before Gleevec, patients die. Median survival is about three to six years. Patients with CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Their only therapeutic option was either interferon alpha, which is very toxic, or a stem cell transplant. And then Gleevec came into the picture. It's a pill that they take once a day. And look at the survival. 10 year survival, that means they're living longer for 10 years, up to 68%. Big change, dramatic change with just one pill that they take once a day. Complete response rate, no cancer, undetectable, 85% in the patients that were prescribed this drug. However, very interesting, and I'm, I'm hoping that you're finding this data very interesting, 40% of the patients will eventually discontinue the therapy due to resistance or intolerance. And Dr. Kayseri mentioned that earlier, that yes, sometimes the cancer will respond to the drug up to a certain point. And then there's that point where the cancer will not respond to the drug anymore, and then we have to find other ways uh, to treat the cancer. Uh, average year, 1.5% of insurance, this is in the United States, insurance beneficiaries receive treatment with antineoplastics. Oral chemo is prescribed to about 16% of them. So you can see the increase in prescription use uh, for oral chemotherapy agents being approved 12 times faster than in 2003, and in a span of nine years, from 1998 to 2007, 22 new oral agents have been approved. I actually need to update this data, because that's uh, 2007, and there are a whole lot more oral agents have been approved since 2007 up to this point. And the cost, I'm sure all of you have been wondering about the cost, so these are just examples. Lenalidomide for multiple myeloma, Annual cost about 74,000 US dollars. Imatinib, Gleevec for one patient. Gleevec for CML, cost ranges from $29,000 to $57,000. Very expensive therapies. But you could see the shift in the paradigm. So before, 
we were talking about uh, every time we talk about chemo, we talk about parenteral delivery, talk about the first pass system. We we're trying to prevent or to avoid the GI tract so that it goes straight uh, to the uh, circulation uh, straight to the tumor. Now we're shifting more into the oral agents. Yes, it's fine. They can go through the GI tract. Uh, and it's uh, more helpful for prolonged therapy if we're really thinking of cancer as a chronic disease. There are a lot of misconceptions about agents, oral agents, uh, patient preference. Most of us think that patients prefer to take oral drugs. I will explain it. I don't want to preempt myself, but I actually have it in the next few slides. So that's a misconception. Not all patients prefer taking oral drugs. In fact, very few patients, there's one subset based on studies that prefer oral agents versus the IV drugs. We also think that uh, oral agents have fewer side effects and are easier to administer. They still have side effects, especially with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. What are the side effects? They're not the same side effects that we see with the chemotherapy agents that we use in the past, which are hair loss nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weakness. For the oral agents, yes, they get fatigue, but the new side effect profile that you see in patients taking oral, uh, oral agents, especially the small molecule inhibitors, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are skin problems. So they get the acneform rash or diarrhea, which we haven't really talked about before with the other traditional chemotherapy, except for a few drugs that actually have those side effects. So not really there are fewer side effects. They, there still are side effects, and those side effects can also be fatal for them. And then many think that because it's a pill, it's cheaper. Well, you already saw the costs. So that's definitely a misconception that not all oral agents are cheaper than IV therapy. Some patients, uh, some are saying that it will be cheaper because you will not need nursing time to actually administer the drug. They go home. You don't need to admit them to a hospital or to an infusion center to give the drug. But there are other costs associated particularly with, with the oral oncolytic agents. I mentioned earlier there's a subgroup of patients who actually prefer to take oral agents, oral oncolytics, and those are palliative care or hospice. 92 out of 102 patients in the study done in 1999 uh, of patients preferred oral palliative chemotherapy. Because of the convenience, they're at home, they don't need to go to the hospital to get the drug, and it's an exclusively oral regimen. That's the other misconception, that if you are taking oral oncolytics, is that you stay home and take the pills at home. Let's talk about one of the therapies that Dr. Picchioni mentioned earlier, PCV for brain tumors. There's an oral agent in there, the C, CCNU, right? But vincristine is still IV. So even if they have an oral agent that they can take at home, they still have to come to the hospital to take the vincristine. So if you talk about convenience, not just because they're on an oral agent, it's more convenient for them, they still have to come to get the other IV drugs. With the oral agents, we're shifting many of the responsibilities that fall, that used to fall on us, nurses and medical professionals, watching the side effects, monitoring the side effects. We're shifting that to the patient and the family. So basically, we're giving them the responsibility to monitor your own side effects and report to us anything that you notice immediately so that we could manage that. Many of our patients incorrectly assume that oral chemotherapy is not as effective, so they think of it as just a multivitamin. Uh, that is particularly true for, for us here in the Philippines. Uh, when I was a student, I re remembered we have a patient in the clinic and you don't use a stethoscope on them, they feel that they have not seen a doctor, right? Even if they don't need a stethoscope. If they came in with a sprain, you still have to listen to their lungs because uh, that's, that's what they think uh, being, uh, seeing a doctor. You, know, you actually use a stethoscope on them. Uh, so it's the same thing with chemotherapy. Unless they get it IV, they don't think of it as an effective way of getting rid of their cancer or managing the, the cancer. We need to monitor the side effects. I've already mentioned that. Uh, but more importantly, we need to do that to titrate the dosages of the drugs. And when I mentioned titrate the do dosage, there's a very small window. It's the same thing for IV versus the, the oral agents. Very small therapeutic index, a therapeutic window. So anything below the view, the therapeutic effect, uh, would be subtherapeutic. That means you're giving them the drug, but it's not doing anything for them. It's not uh, efficacious. Anything above the toxic effect will be toxic for them. So they will have a lot more side effects. Yes, you may be killing the cancer, but you're killing the patient as well with the drugs. So the dose of the drug need to fall in that very tiny window. And that's very difficult, especially for our 
for what we do in brain tumors because you need to push in a lot of drugs. Remember the blood-brain barrier? So that the drugs can cause the blood-brain barrier, but not too much that the patient's actually having a lot of symptoms and side effects from the high dose that we're giving them. And then ease of administration. This I actually lifted from, from one of the patient education materials uh, that we give to patients after doctors see them and they get discharged. I'm not going to read that, but you can see it's a very lengthy instruction. I read that a couple of times. Even I had to think about it several times. Like, what are you really trying to tell me? How many, how many things do I need to remember when I'm on this drug? And that's just the instruction for one drug. Many of our patients take six, seven, 20 drugs. So each one of those drugs will be accompanied with instructions this long. So is that still easy to administer when they have to remember all those facts and all those data? So you can see where nurses can make a difference here. Patient education. Our physicians are already busy enough seeing them in clinic. They may have 15, 20, 30 minutes to see them. So you know that they will not have time to do all this. And it's really up to us nurses to, to talk to our patients and make sure that they know these. Other considerations, uh, maybe not so much of a problem here, uh, but long-term facilities uh, like homes for the aged where may, you may have uh, cancer patients living. So does the staff there know what, the importance of taking those drugs? and how to administer those drugs safely. We've talked about the cost. We know that it breaks the bank. And uh, here, it's, it's basically just a graphic of what influences uh, patient adherence. You have patient uh, predisposing factors, patient characteristics. In nursing, we did a lot of theories talking about health beliefs. We had the health belief model. You know, what makes a patient see a doctor immediately after they get sick? Some patients don't really do that. So we have different health beliefs. We have uh, instruments that can measure that. Quality of life, health issues. Are they even healthy enough to actually go and see a physician? And I'm thinking about here, specifically here in the Philippines, where most of our tertiary centers are in Manila. So if you have a patient, even here in Laguna, it's not that far, but you can imagine if we have a patient in the provinces where they have to take either a plane or a boat to come to Manila and see our oncologists here, it's, you can see how, how that will be a problem in terms of adherence. Social support, they definitely need a lot of that socioeconomic status, again, uh, trying to just purchase the drug would be a problem and uh, an issue for adherence. Forgetfulness, lifestyle factors. And then we have treatment factors as well. I've talked about complexity of regimen. You know, they're not just taking one pill. They're taking multiple pills, plus they have schedules. They have to come in for an MRI, a CT scan every six months. I mean, all those things, when you factor it all together, I don't even know how they can remember, you know, uh, taking a pill or just sticking to the plan. Side effects of the regimen can be a cause. If they start taking the pill and they start developing the acneform rushes, maybe rashes, then maybe the, uh, it becomes so much of a problem for them that they just on their own stop taking the pill, even if they know that that pill can save their lives or can treat the cancer. Cost of the drug, definitely a problem for adherence. And in terms of intervention, uh, we have a lot listed in this slide. And I will make this slide available to all of you. I don't really want to read through all, all these uh, bullet points here but they are simple, practical nursing interventions that you could use. Adherence, taking the drug can be a problem. We've already established that. Uh, and then another example that I could think of, statins. Lipid-lowering agents. 50% of patients taking statin drugs, based on a study in 2002, will discontinue taking the medication within six months. The other... Uh, example that I could think of, and even us nurses do this a lot. When you, how many of you take antibiotics when you're sick? You prescribe antibiotics. You go to Mercury Drug and just tell them, yeah, I have a cough, and they prescribe you antibiotics. You know you need to complete the course, right? But we don't <laughs> really do. Uh, once we start feeling better, we stop taking the rest of the antibiotics, where in fact you should continue taking that until you finish the whole dose. Uh, but even, even nurses have poor adherence. So you can only imagine what our patients who don't even have the background you know, that we have in terms of uh, medical, uh, in term medical background, you know, how their adherence would be when they don't really know the rational for what we tell them. Uh, I'm going to go through these. 
uh, just a repeat of what I've talked about earlier, some of the factors associated with non-adherence, complex treatment regimens, uh, inconvenient or inefficient clinics. Again, traveling to the tertiary center, St. Luke's, PGH in Manila, uh, where you have to commute. Inadequate supervision, poor communication with healthcare providers, inadequate social support, and if they have a history of non-adherence and mental illness. How do we monitor adherence? How do we know that the patients are taking their drugs? Look at treatment effectiveness. If the cancer, if the tumor is shrinking, then you know that they're taking the drug, right? So we could see that using the CT scans, MRIs, maybe you could draw blood and see the markers, uh, the level of the markers. If it's slowly going down, then you know that the patients are taking the drug and that would be the best uh, outcome, if you will, uh, of knowing that the patient actually is adherent to the therapy. We could also assess toxicities. If you have a patient who started developing the acne form eruptions, you know they're taking the tyrosine kinase inhibitors because they have the symptoms or the side effects from those drugs. If they don't have the side effects, then we might want to investigate that further if they really are taking the drug. Because it would be very rare that patients will not have side effects, even at a grade one or you know, very uh, low level. And other ways of monitoring adherence, direct observation. We're very good at that here in the Philippines, particularly with direct observation, DOT, tuberculosis, right? Direct observation therapy. So they actually have to come in and uh, have a nurse observe them take the pill uh, for tuberculosis. Uh, PK measurement, just blood samples, looking at the drug levels. Self-report, we just ask the patient, did you take the pill? Yes, no. Diaries, pill counts, uh, rates of prescription refills. If you gave them a drug to last for 30 days and it's been 90 days and they still have not come back to ask for more drugs, then obviously they did not take the last, the last cycle that they have. And now we're using technology more and more. We have a microelectronic monitoring system. We have actually pill bottles that will measure, that will count how many times they've actually opened the bottle so that they will tell you how many times they've taken the pill. So those are some of the technology that uh, we're using. In terms of safety issues, we need to uh, instruct our patient medication errors. There's a lot of drugs that are that have drug-to-drug -drug interactions. So you need to specifically tell them, you know, take this within two hours or before two hours before meals, two hours after meals, two hours before after the other drugs, drug interactions, and biohazard especially with the traditional chemotherapy, the traditional oncolytics that are oral agents. So you still need to have precautions. Make sure that children, pets uh, don't have access to those and they're not exposed to those uh, oral agents. And this is my last slide. Drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. So we have our physicians working really hard here to develop the drugs. If the patients are not taking them, then it's useless, right? They're not really curing the drug. And in terms of us, for us nurses, I have one story, one really funny story, and that's why I have the picture of the orange here. I'm not sure if in nursing school, do we still use oranges when we teach uh, subcutaneous injections? So it's very expensive. They said orange is very expensive, so we use other fruits. Uh, but that's what, that's what we use to practice sub-Q or intramuscular injections, right? We use fruits. So in the U.S., we do the same thing. We use oranges. You know, we have a syringe. We teach the patient how to draw up uh, a medication from a vial and then inject it into the orange. So there was this diabetic patient that this nurse was teaching on how to administer insulin. So they gave him an insulin syringe with units instead of MLs and said that you have to draw up, you know, two units, four units based on your blood sugar level, draw up the insulin, and then inject. So, okay, return demo. So the patient drew up perfectly and then injected it into the orange. Perfect. So that was, that was the best technique ever. So, okay, they sent the patient home. Two months later, the patient came back and the sugar was so high. So it's like, why is your sugar so high? Well, I did exactly what you said. I drew up the syringe, I drew up the medication to the syringe, injected it into the orange, and I ate the orange after. <laughs> so in terms of education, we need to be very clear on what we tell our patients. That was just a joke. <laughs> okay, and uh, with that, I, I'm done, and I'll turn it over to Professor Queenie. <laughs> Thank you, Marlon. That was entertaining. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we have learned a lot, and I, I think you have your questions ready. Uh, may I call on first our speakers, Dr. Keshari, Dr. 
Piccioni and uh, Mr. Sar <laughs> Marlon, sorry, uh, to come on stage and sit down on the chairs. <laughs> So we have here our speakers in the front. At uh, by the way, if you have any questions, please uh, use the microphone so that uh, you can be heard also around the world. <laughs> by the way, this is uh, web streamed, so we are live in YouTube. Yes. So who wants to... You, Wants to ask first? Si Mr. Magdalas. Oh, Mona. Introduce yourself and then ah, ask yes. the question. I'm Mona Lisa Enriquez from Philippine General Hospital. My question is for Dr. David Piccioni. Um, About the TTF device, I would just like to ask, um, how long do the patient need to wear the device? Um, is it lifetime? So the, uh, the clinical trial had patients wear it for a year, and if tumor hadn't grown at that time, they had the option of taking it off or keeping it on. Um, because this is a disease with no cures, if it's kept the tumor away for that long, most of the patients have just decided to keep wearing it. Mm -hmm. So um, when the, uh, in last November, when the results from the clinical trial came out, it was actually covered in the New York Times, and they actually interviewed one of the patients and she had actually been enrolled on the clinical trial for I think a good three or four years and her tumor had not come back and so she just kept wearing the device every day mm -hmm. because they let her do it as part of the trial and because she didn't have any tumor growth. So the recommendation was to you can stop it a year if there wasn't any growth but a lot of the people just keep it on and we've had many patients wear it for multiple years. Okay, so they have to wear it 24 seven or yeah, so they actually, the longer it's on, the better it works. So actually, you can wear it as little as 40% of the time and probably still get a little bit of benefit. Um, they have a recommendation that it should be at least 80%, but even aiming for 80%, it's, um, even if you aim for 100%, you often just get a little more than just 80%, just because if you get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you unplug it and walk okay. to the bathroom. So if you go take a shower, you unplug it, and you take a shower for a little bit. So there are times you have to change the pads every couple of days to every once a week. So you have to take them off and put new ones on and clean your scalp. So, um, but if people want to take a break from it, if people say they want to have a big anniversary dinner, or they have a real, something they want to go to and they want to take them off for a couple hours and go out and do something with their family or go swimming, they can do that. But you really want to try for as much as possible. Okay, the more you have it on, the longer, the better it works. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mona. Anybody? Yes, Fides. Uh, hello, good morning. I'm uh, Ms. Fides de la Cruz. I'm currently an FIC for N204. Um, unlike many of uh, our participants here, I'm not a nurse. Um, I'm a geneticist. So uh, my question would be for perhaps for uh, Dr. Kesari or Dr. Piccioni. But you mentioned earlier that um, in terms of drug, drug resistance, um, it seems to be, there seems to be rapid, uh, rapid um, differences you, you mentioned that in a, in the span of a month there could already the patient could already develop resistance to drugs and this tells me that apart from mutation this could also be uh, brought about by uh, epigenetic modification so is there any research uh, with respect to um, uh, epigenetic um, modification in tumor, tumor genesis or uh, perhaps even in um, uh, epigenetic drugs that's a, that's a great question. Um, you're absolutely right. We Tumors change very quickly, and uh, there are several mechanisms of resistance. One, one of the simple ones is the fact that it's heterogeneous, or, or there are different clones. There's actually different cancers in one tumor with different genetic or epigenetic changes. And so when we give a treatment, we may just be seeing the sensitive clones go away and the other ones come up. 
but there are other mechanisms that as new mutations coming up or changes in the protein or epigenetics or the physiology of the cell changing over time. So in reality, all those mechanisms are probably occurring one more than another in one type of cancer or one particular patient. The, the reason that we talk about it now more than before is because we have technologies to actually watch this in real time and get data within days um, nowadays compared to years ago where it took you know a year to get results with whole genome sequencing next generation sequencing these machines are available now in almost every research institution and hospital so we can actually look at the dynamics of what's happening we're also working with several companies looking at blood you can actually find tumor dna floating around in the bloodstream very very small quantities but the sequencing technology is so sensitive that you can find these. There's also protein technologies that are doing the same things. And, um, and I think epigenetics is a very interesting topic. And, and there are technologies to look at that. And people have seen changes in the epigenetic profiles of tumors. And there are drugs now that are being developed for all those types of uh, potential mechanisms of resistance. We just need to sort of test these patients, understand what's happening, and quickly respond with a new treatment. Okay, thank you. Yes, Rio. Um, I'm Mr. Dumalaon, a charge nurse from Cancer Center, uh, Philippine General Hospital. Uh, basically, my question is uh, will be addressed to Dr. David. Um, how effective does biotherapy? Uh, works on neuro-oncology, like the monoclonal antibodies um, in terms of prognosis? You know, I think um, in terms of the monoclonal antibodies, I think really the, the really only effective one we have right now for the gliomas is the, is the bevacizumab, mostly because antibodies are very large molecules that don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, the bevacizumab works on attacking the tumor blood vessels, so it doesn't have to cross the blood-brain barrier. It's just getting to the blood vessel side of things uh, and affecting them. Um, there are other antibodies. So EGFR is a common mutation we see in glioblastoma. Uh, there's an antibody for that, uh, cetuximab, but that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier and doesn't work very well. When you use the, we have other ways of inhibiting EGFR, like the small molecule inhibitors like erlotinib, and Dr. Kayseri showed a lung cancer patient with brain mets, and those, those small molecule inhibitors cross the blood-brain barrier and get in much better. So antibody-wise, it's hard to get stuff in, but you can still target the same things that those antibodies are targeting with other small molecule drugs that aren't traditional toxic chemotherapies like the erlotinib. And if you can find a way to get those through the blood-brain barrier, you have a better chance. Anything you want to add to that, Santosh? No, I, I agree. Sir, I have another question. Um, this is more on um, clinical and application. Um, because currently I am assigned in cancer center, and I have observed majority of our patients, medical onco oncology patients, um, because we have a lot of um, ad admitted patients who are in medical oncology, and we have a very rare patients who has in neuro oncology cases. And uh, as part of my observation, but, um, mostly of our patients who are admitted with neuro, -onco neuro, neuro oncology cases has a greater uh, chances of having nausea and vomiting. So I guess because this patient has RTC, um, metoclopramide 10 milligrams every eight hours, but this patient still vomits. So I guess um, the dose will be doubled or um, some modification of the protocol. So you're saying the patients, uh, neuro-oncology patients are more nauseous and yes, less controlled with metoclopramide? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there, I, I don't know whether access of some of the newer drugs, ondacitron, et cetera, uh, and, and even other amend and things like that, there are newer drugs that can be used. And I think, you know, besides those class of drugs, steroids are very helpful in general. It's the most of the nausea vomiting is due to pressure in the brain. 
And so decadron, dexamethasone, can be quite helpful for controlling nausea, vomiting in that situation. So you have to see the different context of what's happening in those patients. But there are stronger medications than metoclopramide for sure that can be used. Actually, sir, as part of our pre-medication we're giving on Dansetron, as well as dexamethasone, as part of uh, the pre-medication. But I guess there's one other drug which was um, introduced to us during our last convention from the Medical Society of Oncology. Um, I guess it's palonosetron. Is it um, possible to give for these particular patients, for your oncologic patients? Yes. You can... There's no contraindication to giving it. Yes. Thank you, sir. We sometimes have to just try new drugs if the old drugs don't work very well. And I think trying combinations of things. So trying Odansetron or the uh, Aloxy. Um, and then if that's not working, the Amend or Apripotent works by a different mechanism or the Metoclopramide works by a third mechanism. So doing, you know, three things that work in different ways. Steroids also help nausea. Uh, the benzodiazepines also help nausea. So we sometimes pile on four or five drugs to help for the really difficult cases. Thank you, sir. Okay. Paul? Oh, last go. Okay, last go. Good afternoon, sirs. I'm John Paul Magtalas from St. Luke's Medical Center in Quezon City. So I work in the cat lab as a nurse. So I've seen a lot of cancer patients with actually under for uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. The patient is brought to the cat lab for cerebral angiogram planning. So mostly I will, I'm just curious. Uh, this question is for Mr. Marlon Saria. Okay, because I'm a nurse, I'll focus on innovations in clinical practice, sir. Do you have any um, innovations or strategies used in the United States that you can share to us in terms of caring for a brain tumor patients in terms of innovations in clinical practice? You, you Anything That's you do a very in the United broad States. question. <laughs> uh... Anything. <laughs> Specifically... Like in specifically terms, in terms in of cancer care, general. What innovations are we doing? Yeah, we. Uh, well, the uh, the main topic for this conference is the team-based approach, collaboration to uh, to manage cancer care. So nurses are definitely a part of that, uh, and I would even I would even dare say that we should be leading that, <laughs> the the collaborative part. Uh, have you heard of uh, navigators. So, so in the U.S., it's it's the up and coming thing. We have nurse navigators who's actually helping the patient from the moment they're diagnosed to until they are free from cancer or in hospice care or have died. So, it actually originated from the nursing uh, profession, but now we have lay navigators who are doing the job as well, or social work who are navigating. But really, their main job is to make sure that the patients go through uh, the continuum of care and not fall through the cracks. So it's very, I already mentioned earlier, that it's very complex. They are not only taking the drugs, they have a scheduled CT scan, MRI every six months. They have to see the specialist, they have to see um, <clears throat> the ancillary department, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and it's just hard for the patients and their family to manage all those things. And that's where the nurse navigator comes in. So it's it's not really new, but uh, yes, it's it's similar to a case manager. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. similar to a case manager, but but, but not really quite because case manager can focus in one department. So you have case managers in med onc, medical oncology, and you have case managers in radiation oncology, and they each do their own thing without communicating to each other. But if you have a navigator, then the navigator actually goes through all the different departments. They will weave through all those departments and follow the patient throughout so that they know the patient uh, you know, like really well and they know the treatment and they can uh, contribute to improving the outcomes because they're getting the patient go through the treatment. Thank you. Thank you for Thank that, you. sir. And also, sir, I just want to add another one. Um, I just, at St. Luke's Medical Center is applying for <laughs> some, some kind of blood works that it's just, they use just small blood for blood extraction. I think that's the th Thera technology. Is it used in uh, uh, is it is it used routinely in diagnose? Uh, I mean, in follow up 
for patients for follow up for uh, cancers? I, I don't think we have that. Uh, we use we only use that for some of our uh, like hemoglobin testing. But in terms of actually looking at our hemoglobin or urine testing, I mean, the small samples. Yes. And even then, we have to go through a lot of uh, quality assurance and quality testing uh, in terms of the instruments. But if you're talking about using small amounts of blood at the bedside, yes, like to look at markers, I have not heard of, uh, I mean, maybe it's being in development right now, but I haven't heard it being used in clinical in current practice. Are you referring to a company in California that does that or? Yes, the fair. I think it, the the name of the company is Thera or the Theranostics. technology. Yeah. Uh, so so, I, yeah, it's very cool. With the drop of blood, they can do everything that we need several tubes of blood to do. Um, and I think uh, and and the, their philosophy is to go directly to the patient and have these clinics where patients go to give little drops of blood rather than hospital or physician based blood IV blood draws. And uh, I think it, it's unclear, you know, how sensitive specific. It sounds amazing, and uh, they raised a lot of money there, and it seems very promising, but I haven't seen any validation of that kind of approach yet. But it looks like they're studying at your hospital, so that'll be very interesting to see how it goes. But I think the wave of the future is to be able to do a lot of diagnostic testing on very little blood as much as possible. And uh, just to reiterate what Marlon said about, um, you know, team care, we, our neuro-oncology team really heavily relies on our nurses, nurse practitioners, et cetera, to essentially function as navigators. We, we as physicians know our patients very well, but our nurses and secretaries even know our patients very well. And uh, the patients call them directly for anything that they need because they have such a relationship. And I think that's very important because at least in our disease, you know, they have a finite lifespan, you know, one, six months sometimes to a few years. So having that continuity of care and having uh, people to talk to that know your story without having to explain what treatments you've been going, what, what you've had over the past year is very, very helpful. And that is exactly the kind of team that we have to be able to do that. Thank you, speakers. Okay, thank That's you. All. Thank you very much. I think we've learned a lot today, right? A lot, right? <laughs> Especially in neuro oncology, right? And brain tumors and uh, innovations in cancer, etc. So may we call on our dean for the awarding of certificate and our program chair, uh, Professor Rita Ramos, Dean Innocentia Buat, to come please on the front. The University of the Philippines Open University Faculty of Management and Development Studies presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Marlon Garzo Saria as resource person during the Improving Outcomes Through Collaboration Lessons Learned in Neuro-Oncology held on 16 September 2015 at the University of the Philippines Open University Las Banas Laguna given this 16th day of September 2015 at the UPOU Las Banas Laguna signed by Dean Ensencio Buot Jr. Okay, Dr. David Piccioni. And of course, Dr. Santosh Skesari. Okay, thank you very much, our speakers. What the ops? Picture, picture. Oh, picture. Oh,
We call on our faculty secretary, Dr. Joanne Serrano, and uh, the program chair for international health, uh, Professor Myra, to come on in front for the photo op. Okay, so I think we thank you, our, our dear speakers. Uh, let me call on now Professor Rita Ramos for our closing at, uh, remarks. Okay, uh, good morning. Hi, good afternoon. Okay, I would like to ask the audience what is the best description for today, for the last two hours. Be just one description. Awesome. Okay, I have to be, you know, okay, how, awesome. And the others, I, lovely. Okay, okay, thank you so much. It's lovely and awesome. But uh, uh, on the serious note, I would like to thank personally our esteemed speakers, uh, Dr. Kesari, Dr. Pich, uh, Pichoni, and <laughs> Mr. Soria, <laughs> okay, I'm having a really hard time pronouncing their names. So again, thank you so much because I would like to inform also everyone that this is also their first time here in the Philippines. Except for Marlon, because Marlon is a regular visitor here. And it's also, uh, this is also the first academic institution that they visited. So we're really so honored. So UPOU is, is the first uh, academic institution that they visited. And um, I would not, I don't like even to uh, attempt to recap the, not even recap, not, not even synthesize, not even summarize, just give an overview. Because for me, uh, what strikes me a lot is the, also you, one of the statements from Dr. Kisari that uh, I think success will come from collaboration and not alone with isolation. So I think it's also a um, uh, very insightful uh, message that I can get from the speaker that also in the in master of arts in nursery we're trying to have also a collaboration thing that in our advanced pathophysiology before i used to handle it alone but now it is already in collaboration with other experts like we have also miss fides uh, from the uh, field of genetics we also have the, uh, mr marlon saria of course, an expert from uh, our onco expert. So uh, that's what uh, we're really doing right now in uh, the master arts of master of arts in nursing, and also with uh, with Doctor Picioni's uh, discussion, it also re made us revisit uh, some concepts in neuro, like increased intracranial pressure. I was uh, expecting Dr. Picionis will be asking some of you about what is the meaning of increased intracranial pressure, but it, he did not, right? And also on the third, of course, Mr. Marlon Saria, who has been really our angel, angel, okay, who helps us a lot really in, uh, you know, innovation and collaboration with the Master of Arts in Nursing. And likewise, I would like also to thank, of course, the Faculty of Management and Development Studies, FMDS staff, for helping us out with this uh, awesome forum, right, a lovely forum. Uh, if not for them, I don't think this will not be a uh, possible for us to have this today. Ano pa ba, Queenie? Of course, I would like to thank personally also our awesome Dean, Dean Innocentio Buot, for coming over. And of course, I would like to thank also our lovely uh, Master of Arts in Nursing graduate who came in, uh, who came in today from different 
parts of Manila. And also, we forgot also to say hi to all our Master of Arts uh, nursing students who are now viewing us from different parts of the globe. Okay, hello po sa Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and ano pa ba Queenie? Uh, US of A, no? USA. Okay, yun lang po maraming salamat and yun, thank you so much. Before we end, uh, Mr. Saria just donated a book uh, for UPOU, uh, uh, edited by him. <laughs> uh, he's one of the editors. It's a core curriculum for oncology nursing. So we will be not putting this one in the library. Thank you. So that ends our activity right now, our forum. So the next part of the program is the lunch. <laughs>